معكم الدكتور فؤاد كمال من جامعة القضائية كلية الآداب والعلوم الإنسانية شعبة الدراسات الإنجليزية. Okay, um, this is Dr. Fuadi from Faculty of Letters, English Department. Uh, so the following lecture is about um, uh, Bertolt Brecht's concept um, of um, the illusion of reality. Uh, we have already discussed this with, through the eyes of Stanislavski and, and others. And today's lecture is... Um, a continuation of what we um, did uh, last week. So um, the concept of the illusion of reality, which is of cardinal significance in naturalist drama and theatre, was rejected by Brecht on, on, on the grounds that it pacified the people's power of, of action. Alternatively, uh, Brecht devised a new technique to shatter the illusion of reality. The device named alienation effect is to defamiliarize what is happening on stage. In other words, it aims at alienating the audience from the demonstrators and, 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 and their actions. What is involved here is briefly a technique of alienation effect which is of taking the human social incidents to be portrayed and labeling them as something striking, something that calls for explanation. So it is not to be taken for granted, not just natural. The object is to allow the spectator to criticize constructively from a social point of view. So, um, as regards the stage properties and, and the characters' clothes, um, Brecht avoids going into very detailed presentation of the sets. He was selective in his choice of real objects. He sometimes insisted on using exaggerated costumes or garments that are somehow marked, marked out as objects for display. The unfamiliarity of the scenes would make the audience think and try to account for the kind of situation with which they are put face to face. In actual fact, Brecht replaces an illusion with another. The illusion of reality, in my opinion, is, is broken by the illusion of unreality. The device of using exaggerated costumes and boards hanging from the ceilings to indicate the place are meant to take the audience beyond the scenes of everyday life in order to consider the differences introduced in the fabricated picture presented on the stage. In this way, the spectator would start questioning the nature of the corresponding things in, in real life, but not those particular incidents within the theatre. So the distorted uh, presentation in Brecht theatre is only an incentive to reconsider the state of things in actual life. Like Lukács, Brecht in an epistemological realist, so he his rejection rejection of naturalism was not an an absolute one. He never argued against the purpose of art in general, and that of naturalism in particular, which is to show things as they really are. Yet he disagreed with the conventions naturalism employed in his production in its production of pictures of reality, it would be wrong to believe that the naturalist theatre is ineffective as far as the voicing of social criticism and the advocacy of change is concerned. The impression of actuality may be looked at from a different perspective to that of Brecht. That the people who are depicted in the play along with their problems miserable conditions of living, exploitation of man's labor, supremacy of the class in power, injustice, etc., are likely, or I would say very likely, to be encountered in the outer world. But it does make the difference uneasy in their seats. The absence of the fantastic and the unusual in the play provides no relief that it is only fiction. The high degree of authenticity of the naturalist scenes may stimulate a sense of 
seriousness and gravity among the audience. This would lead to emotional involvement, which might heighten the concern of the, of the audience and keep the images alive in their minds, even after leaving the theatre. It is very unlikely that true-to-life presentation of a human predicament would, would have no positive impact on the audience. It seems absurd to expect the spectators set to say, right folk, that's how it's like in the real world, and that's all there is to it. On the contrary, their sore feelings and their uneasy minds would start questioning the present state of the tranche de vie, which they have just seen. Therefore, the statement would be, this is deplorable. Real human beings cannot stand this kind of life. Something has to be done about it. The naturalist theatre, therefore, is far from being passive or merely photographic, as some critics presume. The urge for change and the incitement of social criticism find expression in naturalism. Here is Simon Trussler, um, and I'll be quoting him in a minute, uh, in a couple of seconds, who sustains that naturalism is basically a mode of producing, as distinct from reproducing, reality. That it has a capacity for change in accordance with any topical insight into reality perceived by the dramatist himself. So, as to the mitigation of the effect of the audience identification with what is happening on the stage, Brett insisted that the actor must remain a demonstrator. He must present the person demonstrated as a stranger. And this reminds us of the, of the concept of estrangement. He must not suppress that he did that. He said that element in his performance. He must not go as far as to be wholly transformed into the person he demonstrated. The, the, the clear-cut dissociation between actor and character, which is to be kept noticeable throughout the play, might sometimes be counterproductive. The idea that the audience should not forget that they are in theatre is achieved by the conspicuous theatricality of the play. It is not possible that this may perhaps engender the feeling of entertainment rather than construction. The strongly felt presence of theatrical elements excludes the expectation of something real and might create some relaxation among the audience. The absence of the illusion of reality may lessen the sense of seriousness and cause the spectators to sit back in their seats and enjoy the peculiarities of what they see on stage. Um, Brett's objection to naturalism may not be as radical as it sounds. So far as the naturalist principle of communication of emotions to the audience is concerned, Brecht states that, and this is the beginning of his quote, in order not to exceed the model scene, the theatre only has to develop a technique of submitting emotions to the spectator's criticism. Of course, this does not mean that the spectator must be barred on principle from sharing certain emotions that are put before him. Nonetheless, to communicate emotions is only one particular form of criticism. What is significant in Brecht's assertion is his acknowledgement of the communication of emotions as a form of criticism. The fact that there exist somehow similar traits at the backgrounds of both the naturalist and epic theatres substantiates Raymond Williams' concept of the critical theory of the his, uh, or the critical history of the literary movements. A line of continuity preserves touch between the literary traditions, though they appear to be pure forms independent of one another. The absence of very distinguished people, sumptuous mansions and grandiose language, all of which require a high degree of theatricality in natural drama, exposes the latter to the criticism that it debases the aesthetics of the theatre. An extravagant supply of the stage properties is not needed in the naturalist theatre, nor are highly sophisticated devices of manoeuvring actions on the stage. It would, however, be misleading to believe that because the naturalist theatre minimizes the range of theatricality, therefore it is artless. No. The process of writing a naturally sounding dialogue may be as strenuous as producing an eloquent speech. More important is that 
The naturalist player tries to achieve a high degree of objectivity, sincerity, and above all, the presentation of the true face of things, no matter how bitter that truth may be. The passion for truth is the art of the naturalist theatre. Rejecting Flaubert's and the Gongo's passion of exoticism, Nietzsche appreciated the element of sincerity in naturalism. Nietzsche regards the romantic cult of passion and the exotic as a form of the prevalent falsity in the art. He said that striving for such effort betrays a lack of power, not abundance. By contrast, he values 19th century realism or naturalism insofar as it is an effort at sincerity in revolt against romantic lies. To disregard the aspects of sincerity, the attempt at authenticity, and above all, the revelation of some truth about the human condition would be sheer Philistinism. Right, now I'll try to put you in the picture, I'll try to put, uh, 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 conclude by referring to um, the last um, two lectures um, in parallel. So what I've tried to do here is to endeavor to, to define uh, my personal view of the theater of naturalism and theater. So it has also been my intention to establish a theoretical basis which would underlie, you know, the discussion of the plays, most of those naturalist plays have been referred to. So here, it, the, the, the last two chapters, if you want, take the form of a, a, a body, which mainly consists of three parts. So first one is, uh, comes in the form of a critical assessment of the principal tenets which characterize the theory of naturalism. Then I have focused mostly on Zola and Strindberg on account of their crucial position their manifestos occupy in the establishment of the naturalist theory. In respect of these two theories, I have come to the conclusion that some of the, their views regarding the naturalist theater are, are and still will be open to question. I have discovered, for example, that Zola's obsession with formulating human behavior among, uh, upon scientific rules is quite overblown. Accordingly, Strindberg advocation of the use of imagination by the audience at a moment when it could have been done without is very disputable. I have also dealt with naturalism on the level of acting, and here uh, I brought in on, uh, on, uh, Antoine Grain and Stanislavski as illustrations of the practice of the naturalist theory. Again, I have demonstrated, as far as I can judge, the prat practicality as well as the weak points in their methods of acting and producing. So the final section represents a review of the criticism which has accompanied the naturalist theories for so long. I have preferred to refer to more than one example of criticism for the sake of a wider view. I have also discussed Brecht's and Nietzsche's view of naturalism after I had considered Lukács. Like any other literary movement, of course, naturalism contains strong and weak points or aspects. However, the, attra the attachment to reality, the concern over human beings are not abstract concepts, and the pursuit of truth highlights the importance of this movement and sheds light on the previous as well as the following traditions. Thank you. That's the end of my uh, lecture. Um, if you guys have any questions, you can always get, go back and, and uh, get back to me by sending, um, you know, what's a message, and I'll clarify points. That was Dr. Fuadi from the English Department, uh, Faculty of Letters and Human Sciences at the University of Qadiyyad. Thank you.